What we're doing now is coming to deal with what is the phenomena that is called the separatist churches. Uh, basically, this uh, I will read in a few minutes from, uh, from this book about what brought these about. But it's, it's the phenomena of having churches that are cults that have come up during the period when we've actually had churches in, in, um, in Africa. So it's different from, for instance, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the Jehovah's Witnesses did not begin from Africa. It began from out there and then has been imported or exported to this part of the world. These would have been churches that the, the initial leaders were converted within the, the context of uh, foreign missionaries. So it would have been, if I can use an example of, uh, if, if for instance any of you became a Christian, maybe at this church through the ministry of the pastors here. And uh, so you, 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 you have come from whatever world you were in and you now profess faith. And while you are in this church, you, you begin to feel like this church is too American or is too British or is too foreign. It's, it's not quite getting where the African himself is. And then you leave, um, well, in fact, most of them didn't even leave. They were kicked out in the process. But you begin to preach and to conduct meetings that were really representing your, your flavor, your, your, your understanding. And in the process, either you break away or you are kicked out of, and then you begin your own denomination. But anybody who is a, an evangelical soon sees that you have abandoned the true gospel completely. In trying to, to take this to where you really feel it ought to be, the true gospel is finally abandoned. That's really the phenomena of the separatist churches. So I will read a little bit, and then again, I want us to process this. So instead of us just looking and saying, oh, it happened in history, I want us to think about ourselves in this situation. Okay, so um, let me find the place. Mm. Yeah. Independent Christian movements from 1960. So as you can see, we, we are almost here. We've almost arrived. Um, two, three, nine. Uh, this is what uh, Mark Shaw says. I won't read the whole of it, but just sufficiently for us to see where all these are coming from. I have a, a list of a few of them here, but I just want to also hear from you if you are aware of such within the context of Ethiopia. And then we talk about them, uh, how to deal with that, and then we come to the end of today's session. Okay. Uh, in the heart of Zaire, which is the Congo now, lies the holy city of Nkamba. In this city lies the body of Simon Kimbagu, prophet and founder of the Church of Jesus Christ on earth through the prophet Simon Kimbangu. For several decades, the guardian of this holy city was Dialungana K. Solomon, the second son of the dead prophet. To honor his father, and to exhort the city of Nkamba 
Solomon wrote a Kimbanguist hymn and translated in English, it is being loyal to the new Jerusalem. Being loyal to the new Jerusalem. The hymn speaks of how the humiliation and suffering of Africans came from the heel of Satan, but that God had sent his prophet Simon Kimbangu to convert hearts, perform miracles, and teach the Bible, lifting the people up from their suffering and humiliation. Kimbagu had done these things at Nkamba. Nkamba was thus the sacred place where God our Father and his Son Jesus Christ are returned to us. And uh, I know those words mean almost nothing to you, are returned to us, but that's part of the separatist movement philosophy that uh, we have been alienated from God the Father and the Son, but now we, he is returning to us. We are reconnecting with God in a very real way. In the 60 years before independence, convictions as powerful as those captured by Solomon gave rise to thousands of African independent churches, thousands of them, and new religious movements like the East Africa Revival. Listen to the numbers here now. David Barrett estimates the number of independent churches at 5,000 by 1970, with approximately 13 million members, 13 million members, by 1970. South Africa led all countries with, with some 3,000 groups. So out of the 5,000, 3,000 are in South Africa alone. Nigeria was second with 7,000. Kenya numbered about 150. John Bow estimates the total number of such groups by 1990, so this is now just going back 30 years, 1990, to be 8,000 across Africa, 8,000 groups. And listen to this, with 30 million adherents. 30 million adherents. For Zambia, which has 15 million people, it's twice the population of the whole of Zambia being in these churches. So inevitably, we want to understand the, this phenomenon. Here we are with churches like this one, worshiping well, and then so many millions break away, and they are claiming this is the real Christianity. This is Christianity as we Africans ought to have it. Don't follow those white missionaries and what they have uh, brought. This is now God communicating directly with us and through us. So, reasons for the rise of independency are many, and he gives a few. Some point to the Protestant practice of separatism as the principal cause. In other words, we, we strongly believe in independent churches as Protestants, largely. Okay, so they are saying this is just another form of independent church. Okay, I'm sure this church here is independent. So, same animal, just a different color. Others stress missionary authoritarianism. By that, it's, it's a reaction. You know, the, the missionaries are always demanding that we, we follow what they say. They're not listening to us. Hey, we can go. We're going to go our own way. That's a second reason that is given. 
Here's the third. A desire to preserve something of the African religious heritage and ritual is a possible third clause. Okay? In other words, we want to worship like Africans. Eh? Why should we be following the way of the Europeans who brought Christianity to us? So we're going to do it our way. That's a third possibility. But then uh, the author here goes on to say, a more fundamental cause, however, lies behind these whether they spoke of sacred places on the land as Solomon or sacred places in the soul as did the revival brethren, the East Africa revival, a common concern of all independence was one, the problem of evil and two, the way of deliverance. The problem of evil and the way of deliverance. So let's just quickly go through those three, and after we go through them, I, I would like us to discuss. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a list. In fact, I'll just probably just name them across here in the book, and then we can discuss. The first face of evil was humiliation or shame. To treat someone who was deserving of honor with disrespect and contempt was a great evil. This is the first suggestion as to why these churches have thus taken root. For many Africans, the words of Solomon rang true. Africans were the most dishonored of all races whom God created in this earth. That's the way they felt, that we've been dishonored by everybody. The contempt of colonialists and missionary, missionaries inspired a number of reactions to deal with this evil. Church splits were one. This became the so-called Ethiopian type churches from which they, oh, sorry, not so very different in doctrine or in practice from the missionary churches from which they separated. Okay, so this is one type, one group of separatist churches, whereby when you go to them, they, there's not much difference with the churches they separated from, but they have left primarily because they felt that they were being treated um, like second-class citizens in their own church, so they broke away. Their contribution, as Richard Gray has written, was to challenge racial discrimination and white domination in church and state. Okay? Uh, this was largely true, for instance, in America with what is called the, um, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church that basically grew out of South America among uh, the sort of the slave, um, slavery context, where they thought, okay, why should we always remain secondary citizens in the church? So from the Episcopal Church, we start our own, and it was the uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. So that's a typical example, and there are quite a number in Africa like that. The second face of evil. So you can see evil here is being used widely, okay, as something we, we, we don't like, something that's hold, holding us back from full uh, fulfillment. And the second face of evil came not from the society of mankind, but rather from the mysterious world of the spirits. This was the evil that distracts so that detracts or destroys life. Such things as illness, infertility, pestilence, famine, and sudden or 
inexplicable death have more than natural explanations to those who believe in this second evil. Remember when I said that Africans don't just die. You remember that? I mentioned it yesterday. That there must be some explanation in the spirit world. This is the second one. Ancestral and demonic spirits are the underlying causes of all these things. Witchcraft was a religious industry in Africa built around the existence of this second evil and the widespread fear it generated. We talked about that earlier today. So Christianity appealed to traditional African society but partly because it gave a name to this second evil. And the name was Satan. Satan. He's been identified in the Christian Bible. And partly because it proclaimed a power greater than the demonic, the power of the kingdom of God. Let's go on. A second kind of independent Christian church, sometimes called spirit churches or prophet churches, appropriate, appropriated this aspect of the Christian message and proclaimed the existence of sacred places like in Kamba, in Zaire, or the Congo, or Isaiah Shembe's Ekufakameni, Ekufakameni, that is, high and elevated place where the kingdom of God would come on earth. When the Kimbanguists sang about being loyal to the new Jerusalem of Nkamba, it was because it was a place of miracles and healing. The kingdom was thus conceived by such churches as a spiritual power to overcome the power of Satan, the ancestors, and the demonic. So that was a second cause of these separatist churches. It was the thinking that uh, the, the white man who has brought Christianity is, is not quite touching the core of the evil from evil spirits that is affecting us as uh, Africans. And so the same thing that's happening in the village with the medicine man or the witch doctor, although he's using satanic powers, now we are doing it with the power of God, which is even a greater power that it can defeat the, the evil one. So instead of just going to worship, sing songs, listen to sermons, and go home, hey, <laughs> we, we need to deal with these practical issues. You know, uh, my, my father died mysteriously. We did an answer uh, to, to that. And so there must be some prophetic utterance that's going to deal uh, with this. Uh, my wife, this is now 12 years, she's not given birth. Uh, we, we, we need this um, lack of conception to be delivered and so on. And um, instead of going to the witch doctor in the village, uh, the, the man of God should be able to do it and so forth. So um, th those churches began to try and satisfy or fulfill that predicament. The third um, is that element about God coming to us now, God uh, the Father and the Son coming to us. The third face of evil was that of alienation. alienation. In Solomon's hymn, he writes of how God our Father and his Son Jesus Christ are returned mm. to us, and us meaning to us Africans to us Africans. Such language assumes an earlier alienation when the people were estranged from the father and the son. For many independent movements, alienation was the least 
of the three evils that plagued them. So this was not the most important reason. The first was being treated like second or third, uh, third class citizens. The second was that the, the churches were not meeting the, the needs of uh, the people. So this was a third, you know, sort of right, right down there um, and so forth. For adherence of the East African revival, this third was the most deadly one. Alienation refers to the feeling of being a stranger, of not belonging, or of being separated from the source of blessing and fullness. Christ's question from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, captures the anguish, the anguished essence of the alienation. If one feels separated from the kingdom of God, the source of all blessings, more may be required than founding a new denomination or conducting a pilgrimage to the sacred place. We are alienated from the power of God, not by geography or by ritual, but by attitudes like spiritual coldness or deadness. I'll, we'll come to that in the next paragraph. In fact, the next two paragraphs. Yeah. For many Africans, the shedding of blood is necessary to deal with the evil of alienation and bring the distant God near. In the East African revival, the blood of Christ was, central, was the central symbol and the source of power and efficacy. Though the most famous revival him was we praise you Jesus the second most um, um, the second close um, the close second was the song what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus one Anglican missionary became so concerned about the emphasis on the blood of Christ that he requested revival leaders to cease using this chorus. But for those seeking to conquer the evil of alienation, the symbolism of a sacrificial death was too crucial to ignore. Through a new awareness of the power of the blood, one can be awakened from spiritual slumber and find the internal Jerusalem of spiritual blessing. By joining the ranks of the saved ones, the evil of unbelief and indifference to spiritual things can be broken. And notice, through the blood of Christ. Can be broken. And one can walk in the light of the kingdom of God. So for tens of thousands of African Christians in the 1940s, and 1950s, so we've arrived in the last century, by the way, the path for alienation to the kingdom led through the experience of becoming awake. Zukuka. How do you say awake in your language? Wake, wake up. Okay, it's a little different. In Zambia would be uka. So you can see the Zukuka is quite close uh, to it. It's, it should be a South African one. Okay, so um, these independent movements rose from 1890 to 1950 and then reached their height during the 1950s and 1960s. Though different from the social gospel, that characterized many mainline churches in post-independence Africa. So, you know, understand a lot of churches became liberal and all they were doing was teaching, you know, the need for equality, justice, and so on and so forth, good works. These religious movements stressed the inbreaking in current time and space of the kingdom of God in power and glory. This intensification of the motif of the kingdom on earth 
anticipated the dominant witness of the churches in the decades after political independence. For all three types of African independent Christian movements, release from the power of evil, wherever it was encountered, involved yet another metaphor, the coming of the kingdom. Okay, so uh, Niger uh, sorry, Ethiopia, there is something that is mentioned here. I will uh, skip that for now. Um, but there's quite a lot that is uh, mentioned there. Then um, you have uh, in, in 1929, uh, Ruben Spatas founding the African Greek Orthodox Church outside Kampala. So that is now in Uganda. And then in neighboring Kenya, a, a burst of the Ethiopian independence occurred. So what was happening in Ethiopia reached um, Kenya with the African Orthodox Church being formed in Kikuyu land. Um, let's move on. Um, then, so these would, be, would have been the first kind of category of churches. Then they are the prophet churches dealing with that middle uh, sort of deliverance kind of uh, uh, spirit. So there you have uh, the Zionist churches of South Africa, um, very well known uh, there. Um, then you also have um, Isaiah Shembe, okay, he's in South Africa, but you've got W. Wade Harris in Ivory Coast. You have Simon Kimbago, who was mentioned in Zaire, You've got Garrick Braid um, and the Aladura prophets of Nigeria. So these are uh, opened up a little more as uh, this book continues. Um, Harris um, is, is opened up further in Liberia as well. Um, Simon King, uh, Kimbangu is talked about there in the Congo. Um, I won't go into their details. Mm. And then we come to the East African revival with the blood of Christ. Uh, I don't know whether this is common here, but you know, I find it so common in Zambia. Uh, people will, will speak in terms of uh, protecting your car with the blood of Jesus, yeah. you know, and, and things like that. Uh, so that it's either not stolen, it doesn't get involved in an accident, but it's there in the praying as they are praying. Uh, we, 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 we shield uh, this car with the blood of Jesus. And it's, it's all in this third category here. Okay? Um, so the pioneer figure of this revival was a Bagandan named Simeone Nsibambi. Simeone Nsibambi. Uh, and so that is um, opened up a little further there um, as, as part of uh, this entire third uh, category with uh, the, uh, the alienation now we, we can feel him a lot more. We can sense God is now with us and his son is with us, brought near through uh, the blood and protection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, then we are told about uh, uh, the height of these independent churches. Adrian Hastings has called the 1950s the golden age of independency. There is the cherubim and seraphim of Nigeria spread over into Ghana. And um, there is the Christ Apostolic Church showing signs of maturity, even opening a theological college in 1956. Um, the Kimbanguist movement 
being recognized by the government in 1957. Uh, new groups like the Legio Maria in Kenya uh, that multiplies after 1963. Um, the Matthew Ajuoga's Churches of Christ of Africa that broke off from Anglicanism in Western Kenya in 1958, and so on. So there was just a new age that took place as these began to multiply all over Africa. And then uh, part of it was uh, the women that became prophetesses and then began to run their own independent churches. And these are listed here, um, some of them being in Zambia. <laughs> The 1950s and early 1960s were also the decade of women prophets, like Alice Lenshina of the Lumpa Church of Zambia, Gaudencio Aoko, um, the Legio Maria of Kenya, Mia Chaza of Zimbabwe, Miriam Ragot, uh, Ma Ku, Ma being mother, so Mother Ku, Oma Mbele of South Africa and Captain Abiodam, uh, Abiodan, sorry, of Nigeria, um, and so forth. And I just want to read a bit of uh, uh, the um, Alice Lenshina, since from, she's from Zambia, uh, because you can ask me questions about her. Uh, afterwards, and then we will open it up for, for discussion. I think that would be enough. So he says here, consider the case of Alice Lenshina from 1920 to 1978. Uh, the turning point in her life came when she was 33 years old. Alice had contracted cerebral malaria in September 1953 and slipped into a deep coma. Family and friends began to prepare for her burial in the village of Kasomo. To the surprise of everybody, Alice recovered. Even more startling were her stories of a heavenly encounter with Jesus Christ, who called her to be a prophetess and to live up to the meaning of her name, Lenshina, which means queen. A revival gathered around her as she shared her testimony. She became baptized at the local Presbyterian church and enjoyed the fellowship of several missionaries. In 1955, the character of Lenshina's revival had changed. Its most outstanding feature was no longer the call to repentance, which was part of the earlier uh, period, but the eradication of witches and a strong emphasis on millennialism. Her movement organized itself into an independent church called Lumpa. Her home village of Kasomo was declared a new Zion, the headquarters now. The movement grew to 100 thousand adherents by 1961. So imagine in six years for you to have such a following. 100,000 followers. Alice reminded followers repeatedly, do not look for the things of this world. To be faithful to their heavenly King Jesus, her followers were gathered into Lumpa villages. So they now had their own villages, where they became a body politic of their own, a sort of independent, theocratic, peasant state. When Zambia achieved its independence in 1964, this independent, theocratic state was perceived a threat. Well, it wasn't just perceived a threat. They, they, they were like 
a kingdom within a kingdom, wanting to have their own way of doing things, paying tax only to their own leader, and so on, when you're inside another country. Lenshina's former primary school classmate, President Kenneth Kaunda, eventually ordered his police to destroy these kingdom villages. 700 people were killed. Alice was imprisoned. Her church was burned. It would be a mistake to read this conflict as a clash between heavenly minded African Zionists and a secular minded nationalist government. To say it was a conflict between rival versions of the kingdom on earth would be closer to the truth. So, I have a list of them there. The African Baptist Church in uh, Malawi, Elijah the Second Group in Nigeria, the Kimbanguist Church in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Zionist movement in Southern Africa. Okay. So I simply say these were usually reactions against Western efforts to stop syncretism. Okay, so thank you very much. Remind me after this. Anything else um, on the, this, the separatist movement? It's so much part of the African church that uh, it's, it's uh, I, I said to people that the prosperity gospel in America crossed over the Atlantic and basically metamorphosed into something of this. And that's what has uh, gripped the, the African continent by far. And it's come through the evangelical Protestant church and then it's, it's wreaking havoc. Um, Back home in Zambia, I mean, I have cases where a young man comes to me and he says, you need to speak to my girlfriend because she's sleeping with her pastor. Okay? So I, I then talk to the girlfriend, and the girlfriend is saying to me that actually the pastor, I've got two other sisters who are older than me, and the pastor sleeps with all three of us. And I'm, I'm trying to process this because this is supposed to be church. So, and then she says, actually, our eldest sister, who was in fact married, the pastor has told her husband to move into his house and he's now moved in with my brother-in-law's wife, which is my eldest sister. So he, he, he now lives with her. So I'm, I'm now trying to understand, okay, how can a church accept all this? Because it's obviously wrong. And then the, the young lady begins to explain to me, and you can't miss it that it's this. And it's the fact that um, he has said that the family has a curse, the entire family. There's a curse on them that God has shown him. And to rem this is a curse that has come from generations. So he, he's busy trying to remove that curse. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I agree. He's a curse. So you say, okay, but, but how are these girls failing to see this? How? So this girl says, so I, I, I abandoned that church completely. And what happened in the abandoning of this church was that that same pastor was now to take the three ladies with him from Zambia to Malawi. He was going on a mission. And because she was fed up with sleeping with him 
who was sleeping with the other two sisters, she knew that this, this is what's going to happen on this journey. And so she decided she was not going to go. So she initially faked illness, that I'm sick, so she shouldn't go on this journey. So the, the two girls went, the, the two older women, and when they came back, she had packed her bags and escaped from the house. And this is what she said then, that the man, that is the prophet himself, the pastor, and her two elder sisters are saying to her that because you've run away, you, the, the curse that was on the whole family is now being taken away from everybody else and is now concentrating on her. And if she's to escape that curse, she must come back. And here I am now talking to this girl and she's crying. She's crying. And unfortunately for her, instead of the boyfriend being sympathetic, just the thought that this girlfriend of mine has been sleeping with this guy, he also broke off from her. And so she was now saying, the curse is on me. That's what's happening consistently on the African continent. It's this somehow power, but obviously it's not Christianity, because we know what Christianity is. And the, 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 the thinking is that the Christianity that is all about preaching and preaching the gospel, but preaching, is not quite doing it. It must be something more. And in the end, it's the African traditional religion coming in through the back door into the church. Yes? How is it going to this kind of relate? When I was doing my, my PhD thesis, that was one of my biggest struggles with my professors because I argued that a missionary of necessity begins with um, the, the, the word I used, um, a sense of superiority. Because he knows that what I know, the people don't know. So however much you might want to argue, a missionary begins on that note that these people are ignorant of the truth, I am bringing that truth. Number two is that all of us have got cultural glasses, all of us. Um, it's theoretical to say remove your cultural lenses. It's theoretical. None of us do that. It's part of the way we eat, it's the way in which we socialize. It's, it's the way in which we, we view other people. Um, and, and therefore, it is inevitable that the missionary will come with his cultural baggage. It's inevitable. It's, and it's not that he's doing it deliberately. He's not even conscious of it. Um, the way in which he relates with his wife, it's, it's cultural. And he finds where he's going, um, men and women are not showing any signs of affection toward each, each other. He, he's, he's wanting to preach to change that because that's, he, he <laughs> I remember soon after I left university when past, I mean, I was just a member of a church and the pastor there did a seminar on marriage. And then he said in, in that seminar that, you know, you men need to learn to say to your wives, I love you. <laughs> the men burst out laughing at him. They burst out laughing. Uh, 
Now, because I was in the congregation rather than with him, I was hearing them speaking to one another. And they were saying, the, the white man has misled him. <laughs> He's been misled by the white man. You know, if, if I start speaking like that to my wife, she'll become stupid, you know? <laughs> So obviously, it, it, it was culture versus culture there. Okay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so we all come with our baggage. There's, there's no doubt about it. Okay. So what I said then, uh, with what I argued for in my, in my thesis, was that part of missions work is in that next phase, when you now begin to raise leaders for the church, and you raise up individuals who now you can see that the, the rudiments of the Bible they have, they've caught it. The difference is they are children of their culture and you are not. And thus you begin to learn from them how you can better understand their culture. So basically, you, you come off your pedestal, not in terms of, I don't know the truth. You obviously know it. But now in terms of, my friends have also risen as I've been teaching the truth. Let's now engage at that level. So you, you are now listening to them. You won't change. I mean, you can change a little bit. But really, you are still you from your background. You are changing a little bit, especially when you now go back home where you came from. You, you, you become like one who doesn't identify with that culture and you still don't identify with where you come from. And then comes the third and final step, which I argue for in my thesis. And it is where you hand over. You hand over to the local leadership, knowing that some of the things that will now come into the life of the church, you will be uncomfortable with. But it's, they are not anti-Bible. They are largely cultural. And that's the third and last step. So that you are not compromising the truth, but you're now recognizing that this is a cultural expression of the same faith. And I think that's what, uh, is it Abby, was actually finally saying. Um, it's not so much that you yourself divest your culture from, you can't, because that's the way we are. And even ourselves as locals, when we now go to evangelize elsewhere, we'll also go with our culture. It's, it's, uh, it's inevitable. So, um, and then finally, what tends to happen, because the church is multicultural, you end up not with one culture or the other, but you end up with more of a mixture uh, of, of cultures. And that was what, one of the things that was very difficult with the first century church between the Jews and the Gentiles. It wasn't so much the truth. The truth was always the same, but it was the expression of that truth, that the apostles were careful not to go one way or the other, to try and get the churches, uh, the people in the churches to accept one another and let that cultural milieu uh, come out in the end. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, where w one culture hangs on against everything else and everyone else, the church dies, inevitably. It dies because everybody else on the outside, they don't identify with it and they, they, they go off.